I'm happy to see so many of you with us today. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, our partners all over Israel in the different uh, universities and uh, NGOs and people from industry that we are working with constantly during the, throughout the year to try and, um, to try and make uh, our, our food uh, surrounding better and tackle the challenges of, uh, of food security. So I'm excited uh, to invite as our first uh, speaker, Professor David Just. Um, he's a Susan Eckert Lind Professor in Science and Business from the SC Johnson College of Business in Cornell University. David. And uh, I guess happy Independence Day. <laughs> Thought about bringing fireworks, but uh, I didn't think security would enjoy it. Um, so I, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank those who've, who've invited me. Um, I'm a behavioral economist, so for those in the room who may not be familiar with what we do, we, we marry psychology and economics. We try and augment economic models to understand what people do, how they excuse me, how, how they sort of make mistakes in the different types of decisions that they might make. Um, and I particularly focus on food and food consumption. Uh, a lot of my work centers around trying to combat obesity. And when I got into this, um, I, was, I was sort of a new assistant professor, and it was something uh, in the States that was very big in terms of policy, uh, thinking about how to prevent obesity, how to, how to curb obesity, anything we could do, any tool that we could bring. Um, as, as you can see here on this chart, we haven't been very effective at it, although it looks like we've been very effective at transmitting it to the rest of the world. Um, and, and in fact, if you go and look at the data and the statistics that are out there, uh, you know, obesity prevalence is, is sort of uh, leveled off in the States. It's still on the rise in other developed countries, and it's on the rise now in, in much of the developing world as well. Sort of the, the astounding thing about it, though, to me, is that in many cases, you actually have underweight malnutrition living side by side with obesity. Um, here's, here's some data from the World Health Organization. Uh, where you can see this, and it's not everywhere. In fact, there's, there's a very nice trend here where it looks like the places where obesity is, is a bigger problem have less of a problem with underweight. But there are a whole bunch sitting there in the middle where they're dealing with both problems. And oddly, oddly, the United States would fall in that category also, in that we have almost exactly the same percentage of our population that is, that is overweight or obese, excuse me, and underweight, right? So we're dealing with both problems at once. And when we try and create policy, oftentimes we're only focused on one or the other rather than focusing on both at the same time, which causes some problems, causes some, some real interesting problems. Um, so what it, I guess, as a little bit of background, some of the reasons that people have suggested for obesity, and a lot of these derive from sort of standard economic thinking, I, I won't say models because a lot of the people engaged in this reasoning aren't economists, um, but they seem to be deriving their, their reasoning from the same types of models that economists use in terms of how people make decisions. And, and that model is that people, people have a knowledge of what choices are available, they have full ability to enact whatever choice they want, and so the choices that they make represent sort of the best possible outcome for them given their preferences and what they want. And when you have that as your model, as your paradigm of how people make decisions, you have a very short list of what possible things you could do to try and encourage people to eat less or to eat better. Um, and some of the reasons that have been proposed for this rise in obesity, decline in prices of foods, also 
a decline in the, uh, the amount of time and effort that's needed in order to produce foods. Um, there's wonderful literature out there that, that documents the foods that are more, um, more calorie dense tend to be cheaper. Um, some of that is, is an artifact of, of uh, the relationship of how they look at it. They, they look at calorie per dollar, um, which there's actually a mathematical identity then that things that are more calorie dense have to be cheaper per calorie, um, the way things work out. Uh, there have been, you know, a lot of people who proposed that this was really the big driver behind it. I'm a little bit skeptical of that because uh, when we saw price spikes around 2008 and, and thereabouts, we really didn't see a huge change in the way people responded to those food, pr uh, excuse me, to the food prices and, and the food behavior they engaged in. Um, we didn't see big changes in, in uh, you know, outcomes and, and clearly weight takes a long time to sort of work its way through. But those prices, high prices were sustained for quite a while and, and did not see a blip of any sort. Um, so it's, I, I at least feel that that's unlikely and there's actually a lot of evidence out there that, that people do respond very little to changes in prices of food generally. Um, there are also a lot of people who've talked about the, the lack of physical activity and that maybe that's behind a lot of this. And there might be also a component that general trends in society as to what sorts of food we find acceptable, what types of, uh, of activities we find acceptable to engage in, the, uh, the types of marketing that's been used for foods. All of these have been sort of blamed for this obesity crisis, if you will, um, with with evidence of each one and counter evidence for each one. In other words, this is a complicated problem and something that uh, I'm not going to propose a solution to right here. Um, so don't, don't, uh, don't hold me to that. <laughs> okay. Uh, that standard economic model that I, I brought up, right, it's, it's the idea that when we are making food decisions, that we are making them deliberately, that we're putting our mind into it that we're actually thinking about it, right? So that, that we are making the best possible choice given the food that's in front of us and the information we have. But if you think about this and if you're like me at all, you'll recognize pretty quickly that that's a really, really, really high bar for food decisions because we make them all the time. I've got a little bit of a picture over here on the left of a, a grocery store from the United States um, grocery stores in the United States, if you've been there, are insane. Um, there are way too many choices available. Um, and I, I don't say that saying that I want those choices taken away so much as you go in and it is very difficult to figure out what it is you should be buying. Um, and when you have that many things to choose from, it's very hard to know, uh, <laughs> it's very hard to know what's right and what's going to change people's uh, choices. Uh, we used to think that, uh, you know, you put a whole bunch of information on a package and, and people will respond to it. And, and so we have these nutrition labels that are very wonderful and they have detailed, detailed information on them. But if you look at this picture of this grocery store, how many nutrition labels are in there that you would have to read to start making these types of decisions? It's a little bit unrealistic, right? Right. Um, and when we look at the traditional sorts of, of ways of addressing this problem, uh, really it's, it's changing prices, it's putting labels on things and, and, uh, and changing the information that's available. Um, and in some rare cases, actually banning some foods. And the, the results that we find from this are actually somewhat disappointing, unfortunately, uh, in that uh, the taxes seem to be much more, uh, much more useful in terms of increasing revenues, um, and they, the labels tend to affect those people who already had some bit of nutrition knowledge to begin with, um, although we're now experimenting, of course, with much, uh, much easier to read labels, much more accessible labels that seem to have a little bit more success, though we're still, we're still learning a lot in that realm. Um, and bands have uh, some other sorts of problems that I'll, I'll get into in a couple of minutes. Um, Part of the problem with these policies, though, is that they tend to be one policy for all, right? One size fits all policy. 
So if we have as many people who are severely obese as we have who are severely underweight, and we create a policy just for the obese, what are we doing to the underweight folks? Right? When we start taxing the foods that, uh, that have higher calories or are more calorie dense, when we start taxing foods that are higher in fat, are we just ignoring them? How are they responding to those policies? When we create public health messages that only address the one and not the other, are we, are we perhaps sending out dog whistles to the underweight that are already perhaps dealing with body image issues that, uh, that lead them to actually exacerbate their problem, right? That, that to me, is a real, a real issue. When we start talking about taxes, uh, the taxes can become regressive, and in fact, uh, in most cases, they are. When we start talking about health education or nutrition labels, uh, really, the difference in the amount of education people have differentiates whether they're able to use those labels or not. And in most cases that, uh, that I've witnessed, it's the people who don't have that education and that ability to use it that we really need to communicate with, right? Um, there are also differences in heterogeneity and behavioral tendencies that we need to worry about. And those are things that we're still just learning about. We don't have a whole lot of knowledge about. Beyond that, uh, Blundell um, has found there's a, a wide range of responses, even just to calorie intake or calorie expenditure. In other words, there are some people when they, uh, they increase their calorie expenditure will lose weight and others who will gain weight. And there are some people when they take in less calories, they, they will lose weight or gain weight. And what drives some of that, of course, is their behavioral responses, I'm guessing. But in any case, there's this heterogeneity. And this heterogeneity needs to be dealt with in a way so that we're not creating a policy that helps a few and hurts a few, or much worse, helps a few and hurts many. So this brings me to my field, the field that I, I uh, care about and that I think needs to be brought into this, uh, this picture, behavioral economics. So why in the world is behavioral economics so useful? You think back to that grocery store where you have hundreds of thousands of choices available to you. And when you have that many choices, that many possible outcomes, right? 285 varieties of cookies on average in a grocery store in the US. Sounds insane, right? How do you know which one of those to choose? You fall back on rules of thumb, on habit, on shortcuts in decision-making, heuristics, right? You fall back on these things that are clearly not rational and deliberate thinking. You sort of look for anything to suggest to you what is the right choice? What is the, the easy way to make these decisions? How do I simplify this so I don't have to think through all that information and compile it all? Because when I'm pushing my cart through the grocery store with a, a toddler uh, trying to distract me, I don't have a lot of time to think. I don't have a lot of resources to put into those decisions. And the same thing happens when I'm at home and I'm making dinner and I've got kids running around uh, you know, the living room. I don't have a whole lot of time to think through what I'm going to be putting on the table for them. Which puts us in this position where, where really we can, we can try to connect with consumers who have a whole lot of time on their hands, or we can try and communicate in some way to these unthinking consumers, the consumers that need the, the, um, something simpler, something that's a little more suggestive. We have to balance this out, however, with, uh, with reactants. Psychological reactance is this resistance we have naturally to any sort of threat to our freedom. Now, I've, I've, I've heard plenty of people tell me that uh, this might be a, an exacerbated problem in the United States, something that we don't see in, in other countries as much. And I, I fully admit to that, though we have run experiments in other countries and now found uh, reactance in similar things. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this, but reactants, so um, for example, there's a, uh, there was a school nearby where I live that, uh, that wanted to reduce added sugar in, uh, in the kids' diets. And their way of doing this was they reduced the amount of ketchup a kid could take at lunch. They could only take one packet of ketchup with their lunch um, rather than three or four. And these kids ended up being incensed. They threw a protest, <laughs> right? They threw a protest. I, the seniors especially, I mean, there, there were various protests throughout the year. On uh, day of graduation, every single one of those seniors, as they walk across the stage and they shake the hand of the principal, 
they hand him a packet of ketchup so that by the end of this graduation ceremony, he had an entire pocket full of ketchup packets. And I, I, this all sounds very harmless, but you've got to think to yourself, if they're taking the thought to have that sort of protest, when they get to McDonald's, they're not thinking, I'll take one packet of ketchup because those nice people at the school told me this is all I should have. They're taking handfuls and handfuls and saying, free at last, right? I'm now liberated. I can do what I want. And, and that's the problem of reactance, is that it doesn't actually change hearts and minds uh, when we, we sort of use the, the stick to hammer people in. Um, so one thing to think about, OK. <laughs> We often face multiple policy objectives, several different things we want to accomplish at once. And let me give you an example of, of this. There was, a, you know, there was this goal. We worked with some people in the desert southwest of the US. There was this goal of trying to increase vegetable consumption, fruit and vegetable consumption, particularly among the Latin population there, um, without hurting profits, right? Because we needed to cooperate with grocery stores, so we were going to have to find some way to maintain profits there. And without increasing consumer waste, without making it so that they got more fruits and vegetables that all ended up in the garbage, they needed to actually eat them. And without increasing the cost of consumers, because these were pretty um, price sensitive consumers, consumers that had very limited budgets. And so we tried something very, very simple, a behavioral nudge. Think about that grocery store where people are looking for anything to tell them what to do. We put these arrows on the ground, and actually, um, here I've got them in, in English. We had them in Spanish as well. They were, they were alternating. Six foot by three foot, they were in the grocery store just pointing to the produce aisle, right? And we, we ran these experiments. We had controls and treatments, and we actually chattered the treatment where we had it in for a week. We pulled it out for a week, put it back in for a week. Whenever we would have these arrows in, people would magically buy about 10% more produce, right? Why? Because they go into the grocery store, they see these arrows on the ground, and they just decide to follow them. Why not? And this leads them to spend more time in the produce aisle, and they end up buying more produce. But when you look at overall sales, it remained about the same. So we aren't costing those consumers any bit more money. We're just shifting where they're spending it, which is a good thing for the consumer, in my mind. On the other side of it, the OK. <laughs> On the other side of that, what about the grocery store? Well, the grocery store liked it because the produce is perishable, and it's a high margin item because it is so perishable. And so this was increasing their profits also. And in fact, the grocery stores that we experimented with, that we put this into, decided to roll out these arrows to all of their chain. And other grocery stores got in, uh, interested in this as well, and, and we've We've now worked with several of them to do similar sorts of things. The thing is, obesity is not monolithic. It's not just one giant group. Low SES women are more likely to be obese in the United States. Of course, if I looked at other countries, I'm sure we could find other sorts of patterns that would, might be different from what we see there. Um, there's no similar relationship for men. So if you're just targeting the poor, you're helping the women, and who knows what you're doing to the men. Um, but you're missing at least some demographic of men that might be important, right? Uh, income is negatively correlated with weight among white women, but that's not true as, uh, among minority women in the States. It's actually positively correlated there, so you're somehow trying to target poor whites and rich minorities, and that's difficult, right? That's difficult in that it doesn't work with our normal sorts of, of policies. Um, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. It's actually a, an interesting example of how this one size fits all policy can backfire and can have problems. Uh, th this is a policy that, that uh, essentially revised the school lunch program in the US. And there are a whole bunch of very good things in this policy. And one of them, and it was all uh, you know, good, good science behind what was suggested and what was actually implemented. One of those policies was to limit the number of calories that was available um, so that you could have, I think it was uh, 750 to 850 calories um, in a meal, which sounds like it's plenty. But when you start having these, uh, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old uh, athletes in high school, they were starving. <laughs> and 
they became so much of a problem within the, the initial phase of the rollout that eventually the administration, uh, the Obama administration, just nixed this requirement altogether. Now, there are plenty of people who would be benefited by having that lower calorie requirement, but there are also some that would be severely hampered by it and were being severely hampered by it so that it couldn't be, it couldn't be there, right? It couldn't help everybody. An alternative approach to this sort of paternalistic, let's get everybody to do the same thing, is this idea of libertarian paternalism. And libertarian paternalism, the idea behind it is we're going to leave the choice set all the same, but we're going to try and set up the choice environment so we suggest better outcomes. We suggest, uh, you know, better choices. So, for example, we put fruit in fruit bowls that are, are attractive near the front of the line because if they're attractive and they're visible and they're convenient, we see a very, very big increase in the consumption of fruit. And in some of our experiments, we've doubled the consumption of fruit by having those sit in a prominent place where they, they are attractive. You find other ways to, to highlight and make attractive the healthier foods that are on the lunch line and the things that are less healthy, leave them there, but make them a little bit less accessible, make them a little bit less convenient. And you get this, this change in how people behave. And there's not necessarily the reactants. There's not the pushback. Nobody's complaining that, well, now I have to ask for the cookie, where before I, had to, I could just grab it. And you don't have anybody complaining, why is this fruit so visible, right? Nobody's pushing back on that. And when they don't push back on that, then it becomes easier to implement this and actually have these changes be accepted. Uh, another example, and I'll try and zoom a little bit here, the Bloomberg effect. Mayor, uh, Bloomberg was the mayor of New York City a few years back, and he had a, a thing for trying to reduce um, soda consumption, which is laudable. One of the measures that he decided to put into place was, uh, was a cap on the amount of soda that you could buy in certain locations within, uh, within the city. It's about 16 ounces, I think, was the cap, if I remember right. And this was so heavily publicized that we were wondering what this had done and whether this had driven some sort of reactance. So we brought in a whole bunch of students, and, and some of them we would expose to um, a description of his policy and, and uh, you know, pictures from his ad campaigns, and others we'd expose to material that was unrelated. And they had, while they were filling out this paperwork, soda that they could drink and, and other you know, sort of surveys and things like that going on for a little while. Uh, what we noticed was that uh, if you were exposed to, to Bloomberg's message, you drank a lot more soda, okay? <laughs> they were pushing back on it. And, and in fact, uh, there's some evidence that there, there was reactance involved, that they were actually pushing back. Um, the interesting thing, from my point of view for this, is it wasn't even. It wasn't everybody who was pushing back. In fact, the females didn't care. They all drank about the same amount no matter what happened. The males pushed back, and they pushed back very hard. They drank a lot more. So having that sort of policy might be something that's really doing something very, very different to, uh, to males and females. And, and in fact, um, I won't go too far into this. This is a, a sort of event analysis of what happened when this policy was announced. Um, and, and you see here on uh, the, the right, um, these are week-by-week uh, -week impacts of, uh, of this policy announcement. And you see from the very beginning, you get this jump up and then it tails off. So it's only about a month that it lasts. But from the time it was announced, people in New York City started drinking more soda. Um, and, and then, actually, the policy was never implemented. It was decided that it was not legal. <laughs> Maybe that's part of why it went away. I don't know. Um, but it is possible to nudge people and to, to try these, these sorts of, of uh, you know, libertarian paternalistic policies in a way that backfires. So I had a, I had a colleague who uh, ran some experiments, and he found, you know, if you would take Pringles potato chips, these things that we have up here, and you color every you know, nth one, let's say every fifth one or whatever it might be, people have an easier time keeping track of how much they're eating, and so they eat less of it, which sounds interesting. So we decided to replicate this, 
And we replicated that result with a pilot. This is a, actually a relatively small experiment. I think this had about uh, 50 or 60. Um, we've since done this with a much larger group, and we actually failed to replicate that first result. But the second result that I'm about to tell you about did replicate. When instead of just giving them colored potato chips, we gave them the colored potato chips and said, we colored these because we have evidence that it, it will lead you to eat less. Then this last bar happens, right? And they eat a lot more. And are they pushing back? I, it looks like they might be pushing back. They might be trying to compensate for what we've done to them. Who knows? But there's some evidence that they're pushing back at least. So it's possible to, to, uh, to actually lead people to reactants through these libertarian paternalistic type policies. Now, I, I don't have a lot of time left, so I I'm, I'm just want to make a quick point that uh, there is some evidence that, uh, that there's a lot of cognitive stress involved with being poor. And when you have that sort of cognitive stress, you become much more susceptible to these types of, of what we call nudges, these types of, of behavioral interventions. And what that means is there might be a way we could use to target different groups and target them specifically for the types of, of problems that they are having in their diet and, and nutrition and, and be a little smarter about this to be able to do it in ways that don't affect stigma, that don't affect their, their willingness to take part in food aid programs um, and might be more effective. A simple experiment we ran at a food pantry that gives out food to the poor in the US um, and, and this will sound silly to a lot of people but this is, this is not something that's too uncommon there. They'll have, they'll have sort of strange choices. They had this one table where you could either choose a bag of three bagels or three donut holes, okay? And if I was food insecure, I would, you would think three bagels makes a lot more sense because it's like three meals than three donut holes, which is like a snack, right? But there were a lot of people choosing the donut holes, except if we took a lot of the donut holes off the table and just displayed the varieties that were available, just sort of three examples of them, so it didn't look like there were as many as available, then they, cut, they started taking much more of the bagels, right? So when only three were visible, about 8% are taking the donut holes. When all of the donut holes are available and, and on the table, there are about 30% that are taking them. It's a huge difference just for how you display it. Um, I need to play this, uh, sorry for being over time. <laughs> but this is an example, I, I worried about whether food insecure would be susceptible to these in, in other sorts of areas. This is some work from Nigeria. We went into some schools where we're trying to get kids to accept orange flesh sweet potato. And we taught them this, this song. It's not quite a song, it's a little bit more of a chant. <laughs> um, that talks about orange flesh sweet potato. I'm sure there's probably somebody in the audience who actually can understand this. I can't, which is why I'm talking over it. Um, but essentially, they go on for a few minutes there talking about how orange flesh sweet potato is going to make them strong and help them perform and, and uh, make them powerful, right? And when we, when we did this, we, uh, we saw some pretty amazing results. And I, I, was, I was interested because I was, I was worried if you have a group where there are many facing food insecurity, that maybe this wouldn't have any impact whatsoever. And if that doesn't have any impact, then why ever do it, right? But if it does have an impact, that tells us even in a place where kids are food insecure, that having the right sort of marketing behind introducing new foods really makes a difference. Trying to connect with them on their own level really makes a difference. We also, uh, had another treatment arm where we, we introduced these sorts of posters uh, throughout the schools where they have a, a famous soccer uh, player, uh, probably particularly relevant right now, um, and, and this message about sweet potatoes connected. Uh, and a third treatment, one that didn't actually work well with just a message about the sweet potatoes by itself. And, and while I won't go through all of the details, when you look at these treatments and you try and figure out what actually happened, you get, these, these are measures of the impact on waste, plate waste, so it's inverse of consumption. Uh, and it's, it's measured in, uh, uh, wow, if I, if I remember right, it was measured in grams of some sort. Um, 
So what you found was, oh, no, this is actually measured in percentage. That's what's going on. So you found a 12% decrease in waste or 12% increase in, in consumption, if you will, um, when they had that song, when they were singing that song about it, right? This engaged them with the orange flesh sweet potato in a way they hadn't been engaged before. And something similar for the aspirational figure, the, the soccer player. You had nothing of import when you had this sort of communication about how healthy it was just generally, right? So in other words, we saw results in, uh, in Nigeria that looked very, very close to what we saw in the US with trying to get kids to eat fruits and vegetables. This, this type of behavior is somewhat universal. Um, and actually, I should mention, when we divided out that, uh, those sample and, and eliminated those who had enough food and looked only at those who said they went to bed hungry on occasion, the results still hold. So that even if we're just trying to target those who are hungry, we might want to start considering these types of behavioral interventions in targeting the people who really need it, right? Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish. I've been given the, the sign that I'm, I'm almost out of time. Uh, traditional policies, I want to say, they can be effective, but they can also be very clumsy in that very often they target everybody, and they're not very easy to narrowly focus on the groups we really need to hit and avoid the groups we shouldn't hit. Right? So that's something that I think we need to address. Behavioral policies can help this because there are ways to design them that will address multiple goals at once, that will be able to address very different things all at the same time. Sometimes we've been able to find large behavioral effects, although I'd say that we're, we're new enough at this that we don't know how long those effects last. We don't know if they maintain the same size for, for the life or duration that we might want them in there. So there's, there needs to be a lot more research done in this direction. First off, determining what behavioral tools will work with what populations, how long they last, and if we can generalize across different contexts, such as between Nigeria and the US or elsewhere in the developing world. I don't believe this is a final solution to, uh, to you know, obesity or hunger or something like that, but I believe it's gotta be part of that solution. It's got to be contributing to it. It's got to be something we think about as we try to address this really complex issue of coexisting obesity and, and malnutrition. And I'll quit there. Okay, you are lucky. We need to set up some uh, presentation here, so I, I will, uh, we will take a few questions if there are for David from the audience. Yeah. If you're going to introduce a new food that they haven't been exposed to before, I guess I don't think it's necessary that we sing every time before we eat, but it's probably a good idea to think about the rollout of that food in terms of making it exciting and engaging, giving them a, a story that goes along with it, right? So having that song gave us some way to introduce that new food that, that was exciting, that engaged them. and, and I. I'm, I'm hoping you understood what, it, what they said. I didn't, but uh, they seem to be excited. <laughs> but in the video, you were talking about sweet potatoes. Yes. And I, 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 I would like to say we grow potatoes everywhere in Nigeria. So I don't see how potatoes is a new food that they have to see right. get adapted to. So I think there's something that doesn't add up. Yeah, it's... it's it's a specific type of sweet potato that we were introducing. It was the orange flesh sweet potato, which had been um, uh, biofortified, right? So it's, it's uh, 
vitamin A enhanced, as I understand it. I, I'm looking to Jan to make sure, because <laughs> she's, she's the expert. Um, so it, it was, you're right, they have potato everywhere. This one was something they hadn't been exposed to, and it was going to taste different than the, the types of potatoes they had been exposed to previously. 